You know, sometimes you just got to have the right connection to power. When you get it backwards, it just doesn't work. And sometimes I think we want to do that with Jesus Christ. We want to connect with Him, but we want to do it the way we want to do it so we're not connected to the power and He doesn't work in our life. See, that's just a free sermon that God gave us through the <clears throat> the battery pack. <laughs> uh, good morning. It is so good to see you here. And uh, I want to say something about the class Wednesday night. Brother Ridgeway and I have been uh, been talking about this for a while, and uh, and uh, he came to me and he said, you know, I feel that the time is right for me to teach. And Sister Ridgeway says, and he doesn't volunteer for anything. And I was I was elated because you got to understand me. I absolutely hate tradition, but I love heritage. And this is what this is going to be about. It's it's a it's a class on heritage of uh, the Church of the Living God from Scripture, and hopefully he's going to bring it all the way up into today's time because of who we truly are. We are not a denomination. We are a movement of the original church of the living God that was established when Christ gave his life on Calvary. That's where it all began. That is our roots. This is how we need to know who we are. And I'm excited about this. And uh, and, uh, I know Brother Ridgway is a a great teacher. And uh, if you don't know Brother Ridgway like I do, you know, the guy was ahead of his time back when I was a child. He was a, a great innovator. He was considered contemporary. I, uh, I've got several copies of this. First time I ever remember seeing this was when Brother Ridgeway was pastoring at Paragould and my dad went to uh, uh, be his worship pastor. And, uh, and uh, this is all the... The modern courses of the day, and it's made so that you can paste them in the hymn book and sing all the, the modern music. We were doing that back in the 1960-61 uh, in Paragould, Arkansas. There's some great, great songs in there like, Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. Man, that was new. That was contemporary. That was exciting. There's nothing... Nothing new about contemporary, folks. It's always been contemporary means just what's happening now. It's just where we are. So we're always contemporary, whether we sing the old or the new. And uh, I just thought I'd throw that in. And uh, do what? That's another freebie. And uh, I want you to know that a, a week ago, Kathy and I were walking through our neighborhood, and we got unoed. We met some people in our neighborhood, and within a minute of talking to them, they invited us to church. Whoa! What a thought. I told them that I'd have some people very upset with me if I went to church with them. But <laughs> and I'm thinking, is this what we do? We meet someone new, and within a minute we invite them to church? Who knows? For the, those of you who don't know, unlock new opportunities. Hope you got your Uno card. I carry mine with me. I've carried mine for ten years as a reminder to unlock new opportunities. Because you never know when that chance is going to come. We got to be looking for it. I'm not going to share the phenomenal story that I was going to share this morning because God told me to use a totally different one. The sermon hadn't changed. It's just the opening illustration. Because I have always been flabbergasted is a good word at the power of God. Uh, It's amazing how He demonstrates His power throughout all creation. Lightning, thunder, mountains, plains, flowers, weeds, 
animal. All we have to do is just open our eyes and we can see the hand of God working in all things. And He has a lesson to teach us in all things that He has created. He has revealed in creation that He has a sense of humor. You ever took a good look at a platypus? Our God has a sense of humor. That's why we laugh. Because it's in our DNA. But God is revealed in the lessons that He teaches us if we will take time to look at nature. The first time I ever read about it, I was in the fourth grade, and, and it, it was something that I wanted to do from that day forward. A bucket list, if you will. We've all got them. Mine don't mean much to me. Much to me. It's like, yeah, I would like to do that if the opportunity ever comes, but I'm not chasing a bucket list. But this one thing on my list, I always dreamed about always wanted to do and in 2005 I got the opportunity Kathy and I went to a conference that I was going to attend and it was in California and since it was in California we said this is a uh, an opportunity of a lifetime we took vacation after we left the conference and we went to Yosemite one of the most beautiful places on the face of the earth. But that's not what I was going for because just outside of the park itself is the Mariposa Grove of the giant redwoods, the sequoias. First time I ever read about them in the fourth grade, I wanted to see them. I couldn't imagine. I want to tell you, they did not disappoint. Matter of fact, they went beyond anything I'd ever hoped or dreamed. And, and I saw a guy that was you know, setting up his camera so he could take a picture of this one. That was the, the, the diameter at the base was 28 feet. Huge. Standing hundreds of feet tall. Oh, I was amazed. And I looked at him and I said, you know, I've wanted to see these since I was in the fourth grade. And he looked at me and says, yeah, me too. And we were both there for our first time viewing these wonders of nature. But I, I, I couldn't help but notice that, matter of fact, you could go to prison if you picked one up and took it home with you. Uh, the, the cones off of these giant redwoods are only this big. Maybe a half inch in circumference. That I got to reading about it because I, I wanted to know more and more and more about these giant redwoods and, and that, that cone takes 20 years to release its seed. Now think about that. And there's only three ways that its seed can be released so that it may reproduce. And the first one is there is a squirrel called a Douglas squirrel that gnaws at it till it gets a hole in it so the seeds can come out. The second way is there is a, a, a bug, a beetle, or, or something of that nature that, that bores holes inside so that the seed can come out and the tree can reproduce. And the third is fire. When a fire comes through, it heats up, the cone dries out, opens up, and the seeds fall to the ground. What a lesson to be taught to us, God's people, through the, the miracle of creation of the hand of God, that in order for us to reproduce, we must be gnawed on. We must have outsiders to bore deep into who we are, and we must be tested by the fire in order for us to open up and to reproduce what God wants for us. Wow, that just blew me away when I learned all that. It's like, oh. And don't forget 20 years. Much like Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, 
spent years upon years in the mission field. His results, I think it was 55 years he spent on the mission field in China, and his results would be considered minimal. But the church of the living God in China today is vast. It's still moving. He didn't even get to see the, the results of the works of his hands. But you know, it's about time. It's not about us. It's about time. Right, Sister Melody? <laughs> she came in this morning. She said, you know, God has blessed her hard work and her efforts and, uh, and uh, she no longer has to work weekends and she's doing what she's called to do. She's teaching second grade at Oakland, correct? And she's so excited. And the first Sunday she gets to come to church in years, she comes driving up and the sign says, it's about time. <laughs> she said, I thought that was so appropriate. <laughs> and you can take that however you want. You know, it's like... She, you know, it's about time. I've finally arrived, or it's about time where you've been, or, you know, you, you can look at it different ways, but it is all about time. Patience. Allowing work to go in, go on inside of us, so that we may be perfected, if you will, to do the work that we are called to do. Galatians 6, 8 through 10. Paul is talking to us about this. Reading from the NLT. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, wherever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Father, it is your words that we desire today. Remove me so that I will be just simply an instrument of your voice. Deliver your words to me first and through me second. In Christ's name, amen. First thing that I see in this scripture is about living. How we live. Paul says if you live to please the sinful nature, you will harvest death. But if you live to please the Spirit, you will harvest eternal life. Now what does this really mean? It's back to Jesus' teaching on sowing and reaping, or in this day and time, we would say cause and effect. Everything we do starts a chain reaction so that we will have an effect in some form or fashion to everyone we meet. There are no decisions that we can make that only affect ourselves. It affects everyone, some greater, some lesser. But every action that we make has an effect. Paul says that we should live to please the Spirit. In Romans 8, 6, he put it this way, So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. 
Now we get confused here sometimes about the sinful nature and living for the flesh and feeding the flesh. We, we get confused because we, we tend to think of the worst people we know and say that is feeding the flesh. But about people, that's not true. Feeding the flesh, living for the flesh, living for the flesh is about living for myself. What I want, but living for the Spirit removes me completely from the equation and gives it to Jesus Christ. How do we do that? That's difficult. It is very hard, especially in 21st century America because we are so ingrained with selfishness as a nation that we are literally disintegrating by focusing on individuals and not Jesus Christ. It never has been about us. It's always been about Him. So how do we do it? Paul says that the first thing we must do is not grow tired of doing good. Really, who gets tired doing good? <laughs> uh, if we're honest, we all get tired of doing good. We all get tired of doing what is right. Why? Well, it could be the reasons behind our doing good. I want you to think on this for a moment, if you will. If we do something good for someone because they did something good for us, you're going to get worn out. Because now you've started a game of ping pong in doing good. A back and forth. Trying to outdo each other and eventually you're going to come to the end and say, I can't do this anymore. I am tired. You see, your reason that you're doing it is wrong. If you do good because it makes you feel good, you're wrong. Doing something right can be wrong based on your motives. To help someone because you get a good feeling is destructive. Sometimes we want to do something good out of obligation. Well, you know, this is what we're supposed to do. We are children of God. We are supposed to help others. We're supposed to share the gospel. So that's why I do it, because I'm a Christian, and that's what Christians do. You're wrong. You're dead wrong. Or maybe you do something good because somebody has pestered you long enough that you want to do it just to get them out of your hair. And again, you are wrong. Because there is there is an element of doing right that causes it to be righteousness and it's it's got to be there and that is God's love. Everything that we do should be done out of love for one another. Because if we do not, we're doing it for the wrong reasons and we will will grow weary. But take heart. There is a way. There's a way to not grow tired. There's a way to not grow weary. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait, see it's about time. It's what it's all about, time. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings as eagles. 
They shall run, not grow weary. They shall walk, and not faint. Do not grow weary in doing what is right. That's our first step. Because when we do what is right, then we will harvest everlasting life. This is really dangerous territory that we tread on if we do not do things from the right perspective, from God's perspective. If we are wrong in our motives, it's dangerous, dangerous territory. Because if we're not doing it for Jesus Christ, we're doing it for the wrong reasons. Therefore, we are... uh, feeding the flesh, we're feeding the, uh, the worldly desires that we have. And, and Paul says that you will reap eternal death, even for doing what is right, because you did it for the wrong reason. It reminds me of Jesus talking about the straight gate, narrow is the road. And few there be that enter in. It's not as easy as we think it is. That's why the value of the blood of Jesus Christ is so great because without it, it is impossible to enter into the kingdom of God. Philippians 3.14 Paul tells us something very important. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. You see, salvation is a marathon. We cannot point to, uh, I cannot point to August 28, 1979 when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ and that's it. That is not my salvation. That is just the day that I began to experience salvation. Because salvation is a marathon. It is a lifetime event. And who is Paul talking to? He's talking to the church. He's not talking to the world. And if he's talking to the church, then it is very easy to understand through his teachings that even though I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, I can walk away and start feeding myself and inherit eternal death. It is not a guarantee. Jesus Christ is a guarantee But you see, we still have opportunity to make our own choices and we must make them every day. Every day we should get up and do as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then we go forward. We must be like David and get up of a morning and and as we're getting dressed and go to put our shoes on, we say, say, today is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Day is a day, and, and, and increase within ourselves a desire to keep moving forward for Jesus Christ because it is with His strength that we do it and no other way. For you see, yes, I was saved on August 28, 1979, but you know what? Today, when I get up and I choose to serve Jesus Christ, I am saved. And on the day that God calls me home, I will be forever saved. For you see it as a marathon. It is an event we must run from beginning to end. The songwriter put it this way. I am saved, saved, saved. Generations on generations. Time after time. Salvation is a gift of God that is new every day. And we must live it that way. You may not like what I'm saying, but talk to my boss. So as we look at the Scripture, we understand we've got to live to please the Spirit. It is about time, but we've got to understand that God's time is the right time. Reminds me of an old blues song. For God's time, what a lay. Is the right time what a lay? Just for <laughs> God's time is the right time. 
We want now. We believe in now. We go out to eat and we want service now. We go to the store. We want all the checkouts at Walmart open because we want to check out now. That's who we are. We want answers now. God doesn't work that way. Because He doesn't see time the way we see time because time is our creation, not God's. We have devised a way to measure His creation with a thing that we call time. We have dissected it to the point that we've got it, you know, you know, down to seconds. Nanoseconds. I don't have a watch that does that. But we, we've dissected it. But God doesn't work that way. Just us. When we say, I've got to be there. You know, church starts at, at 1030. I've got to be there uh, 15 minutes early because... You've got to get this, folks. If I'm not 15 minutes early, I'm late. I want, that's, that's not a point, but write it down. <laughs> no, we say we've got to be there, but God doesn't work that way. Do you remember Lazarus, his friend? He was dying and Jesus delayed going till after his friend died. There was a song a few years ago that said, even when he's four days late, he's right on time. Because that's the way God works because God doesn't see time the way we see time. Peter tells us, 2 Peter 3, 8, but you must not forget one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like today. You see, God, God steps back and sees time from beginning to end. We only see right here and now. You know, by faith, we think there's something going on on the other side of the world, but we really don't know. We're not there. This is all we really know is right here. This is our reality. But God knows because He's looking down and He's seeing time from beginning to end and His plan is perfect. He orchestrates every day that we live. And He's like a great conductor up there, you know, keeping everything on beat moving so that, uh, that every movement of the song is at the right time and at the right crescendo or the right tempo or, or, or way down here with a little bit of quietness. God works it all. That's how He does it. So if God's time is the right time and it's not the way we want it, why, how must we do it? Well, first off, Paul says don't quit. Just go on and do what you do. The good things that you do for Jesus Christ, just keep doing them. Just keep right on giving. Keep right on loving. Keep right on sharing. Keep right on the believing. Don't quit. Your strength will come from the Lord. Your reward will be in the harvest that you have when Christ comes back. The eternal life that is promised, that's what we are working for. Don't let that word scare you. Because if we don't quit and we keep doing what God has has asked us to do, the good things, the right things, then we grow blessings. We should be fertile ground as children of God to grow blessings not for us, but for those that are around us. Because when God pours down a blessing, it overflows onto others. Am I not right, Casey? You need to, you need to ask Katie and Casey about a, a, a recent blessing that just fell on them. It will just warm your heart and just blow you away how, how great and merciful God is. So if you get a chance, just ask. They'll love to share. <laughs> it, it, it'll blow you away, but then you'll step back and say, you know, it doesn't really surprise me because that's just the way God is. That's how he's a humorous God. <laughs> so, you know, we will grow blessings. 
And how do we do that? By doing right. Because, you know, when we treat people right, they see it and they respond. I have a friend that shared on Facebook yesterday. As she had gone to buy some groceries and she counted up her money and made sure she had enough to cover what she was buying and she gets there in line and there was a, a woman that came up behind her that, that uh, seemed to be struggling, so she stepped back and said, why don't you go ahead of me? And they began to talk, and the lady was sharing her struggles and, and her time with her, and she was checking out, and then the lady walked on out the door, and she was just being kind to her, doing what is right. And then she looked at the, uh, the checker and says, uh, I hope I have enough to pay for what I've got. And she said, ma'am, that lady just left $10 to go on your bill. You see, we grow blessings. That's what it's about. Because when we bless others, we will be blessed because that's how blessings work. We are blessed to be a blessing. So if God blesses you, share the blessing. But absolutely all of this is worthless if we don't get this last part. Paul says, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. My people, we must seize opportunity to do good. Now, there are those that will teach you that the Apostle Paul has abandoned his teaching on uh, being saved by grace through faith because he's preaching here a gospel of works. That is not true. That's not what he's saying at all. Because the truth about grace is grace in our life that has saved us, is saving grace, produces good works. you want to step back and take a good look at your own Christianity, to step back and see, am I, am I producing good works for Jesus Christ? Or is everything that I'm doing always pointing back to me? Because it's very important that we seize the opportunity to do good. And who should we do good to? First of all, he says, everyone. Everyone that he puts in our path. Matthew seven twelve. So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. We call this the golden rule. We teach it to our children. Do unto others you would have them do unto you. But I want you to recognize that this statement is not passive. It is active. The, the verb that is used is an action verb. Do. So we should be about doing unto others as we would have them do unto us. Should be our motto. We should get up in the morning and pray. I told God to speak to me first, okay? So he's preaching to me, and then I'm just passing on what he's saying. But we should get up in the morning and say, Lord, give me opportunity to do for someone else what I would like done for me. How would that affect your day? How would that affect your day when, when uh, you have a big long list of things you've got to get done if you just get up and say, Lord, help me to do to someone else what I would want them to do for me. Jesus said that's 
what the law is all about. This is what the prophets have taught for generations upon generations. To do to others as I would have them do unto me. Why would that do in your workplace? If there's someone in your workplace that you're struggling with that's just constantly giving you a hard time, if you began to treat them the way you wanted to be treated, what would that do? Point to ponder. What about in our homes? If we began to treat our children and our spouses the way we wanted them to treat us, what would that do to our relationships? For you see, there is a deeper truth here that Paul is trying to teach us and we've got to get it and we've got to get it right because we cannot blow this one. This is what it's all about because there was a second group that we are to do good unto and it says especially the household of faith. My people, that's you and I. Paul says that we are to continue to do good to one another, especially those in the household of faith. How we treat each other. And this is very consistent with the teachings of Jesus Christ. He said, they will know you are my disciples if you have love one to another. We love each other. When we do for each other what we would like to have done to ourselves, the game changes. We cannot do effective ministry until we get this one right. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, and that's at home. Whether that is your home or your home church, this is where we begin in how we treat one another. Over the past year, I have learned something new about the value of this teaching. It is so consistent with the teaching of Jesus Christ. And understand, when we study God's Word, we must make sure it is consistent with the words of Jesus Christ. And Paul is dead on when he says we must especially do good to those in the household of faith. Because there is a scripture that has been hijacked by the world to mean something that it does not mean. I've discovered this in the past year in going through some uh, 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 commentaries and and looking at it and, and looking at the Word. And it all deals with the day of judgment. It's in Matthew chapter 25. The verse I pulled out is verse 40, but it's all about on the day of judgment, Jesus says, to those that were the sheep, you fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was in sick and in prison. I was a stranger and you asked me in. And they said, when will we do this? And Jesus said, Matthew 25, 40, And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Jesus' words. Hang on to this. Let's just go there. Matthew chapter 12. Why don't you turn there? Because you've got to get this. Because everything has got to be consistent. Jesus' words were consistent with each other. He didn't say something one day and make it different the next. I want you to get this. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46. Are you there yet? While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, 
His mother and brother stood outside waiting to speak to him. Someone told him, Your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to him, Who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. He's talking about the people that obey Him are His brothers and sisters. And if we do not treat one another right, we will be separated out as goats on the day of judgment because we did not treat one another the way we're supposed to be treated. When we have a brother or sister that is in need, someone that is of the household of faith, we should be right there. How can we reach a lost world when we won't reach each other? And we're talking about judgment here. We're talking about the great and coming day. And what's going to separate us out? Because I believe with all my heart that people that totally reject Jesus Christ are not in this number that's called sheep and goats. Because the goats are the ones that thought they were doing right and are separated. The sheep are those that were just doing what the Master said and didn't even know they were doing what was right. Our Salvation depends first on the blood of Jesus Christ. But it really does matter how we treat brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether they come to this church or they go to another one. We're all from the same family. Bill Gaither put it this way. You may notice we call each other brother and sister around here because we're family. And these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, we all shed a tear and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. The people, we are in a marathon. And it's a race that we must win. And we must pull others into the race with us. And until we get our house in order, we will never do any good outside these walls. God's Word, not mine. Would you stand, Father? Forgive me when I selfishly think of myself when I see a need. Help me to be more loving, more understanding, first and foremost to your people. Because it is not about me. It's about you. Speak to our hearts. Lord, if as you're speaking to us. May we respond positively to you. In Christ's name. It's time for healing. Time to move on. It's time to fix what's been broken too long. Time to make right what has been wrong. It's time to find my way to where I belong. There's a way that's crushing over me, and all I can do is surrender whatever you're doing. Inside of me, it feels like chaos, but somehow there's peace. It's hard to surrender to what.
what I can be, but I'm giving it to something heavenly. Time for a mile, time to begin again. Reevaluate who I really am. Am I doing everything to follow your will? Or just climbing aimlessly over these hills? So show me what it is you want from me. I give everything. I surrender to whatever you're doing inside of me. Oh, it feels like chaos, but somehow there's peace. It's hard to surrender to what I can't see, but I'm giving it to something heavenly. Time to breathe in and let everything out that I've wanted to say for so many years. It's time to release all my hell back tears. Cause whatever you're doing inside of me, it feels like chaos. But I believe you're up to something bigger than me. Lord, to do something heavenly. Whatever you're doing inside of me. Oh, it feels like chaos. But I can see this is so. Time to breathe in and let everything out 